it, it, it obviously, you know, it's, it's, it is a highlight for me to be here every week. I walked across from the Commons again, like I used to on a Wednesday, and now my Wednesday has become a Thursday. So I, I'm absolutely thrilled again to be here. Um, absolutely wonderful. Can I, can I say on that point of format, I, I, think, it's, I think it's the right thing to do, um, but I have a habit of talking too much. And so if I do go over the time, will you hold me accountable and say, Clive, it's time for question time? I, because I will be the timekeeper and I will stop you no less than 10 minutes before the end of the class. Because I want Agreed? that interaction. Yeah, I, I, do, I don't want the format, but I do think the format is a, is a good suggestion. So on that uh, technical note, um, you know, I'm preoccupied um, today, ladies and gentlemen, because students on this campus, students whom I love and care for and deeply cherish, have invited me to sit on a panel this evening. Um, and the panel is um, on a thorny topic. It, it relates to st uh, uh, students for justice for Palestine. And so I just need to say that, and you can imagine the sort of trepidation that I have, knowing also that there will be um, plainclothes policemen present and so forth, that um, I have that sense in my stomach, not of um, butterflies of anticipation, which I have coming here, which are all wonderful and pleasant, um, you know, um, but a different sense of anticipation. Nonetheless, I am on that panel, and if I do seem a little distracted, it is only because a part of my brain is already wondering how that discussion will go um, this evening. And I guess if you know me, you know kind of how I'm going to come at it, um, because all conflicts are problematic. Righty-ho, thank you. I had that on my mind. I hope you don't mind me sharing that with you. Um, um, thank you. Um, uh, I, I gave an introduction last week, which was a theoretical overview of the nature of transitions. We're done with theory. We're going to look at, at South Africa, de facto, the, 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 what happened in South Africa. We are not going to look at films today, but I promise you films from next week onwards. I need to put the groundwork in place because um, the films are strange, and I, I, I don't want to present you with footage which isn't contextualized, I think, appropriately. And that is, that is my task, is to do that for you. So no films today, but from next week. And then one other technical point before I do start, which I'd forgotten, is there was a suggestion that I make these talking points available to you. I would be more than happy to do that. I can't make copies for all of you, but I can make sure that it is electronically circulated, and I'm sure um, those folk who want it will find it wherever you do find these papers. Is that okay? I'll give you last week's stuff. I'll give you today's. And I do indeed have six sets of these things for six discrete discussion sessions. So I'll share all of that with you. Clive, if, if you uh, convey that information to Norma electronically, she will post it on the Ali website. I'll do that. And everyone here knows how to access the Ali website so they can get that information. Okay, awesome. I shall do that. Um, and, and as I mentioned, I did have a student collate for me all the video footage of the 87 Sunday episodes that were broadcast publicly in South Africa. And um, I will put that list on as well. It's, it's a long list. It's about 40 pages worth. But if any of you want to see certain snippets at your own leisure time, they are thematically listed. You can see if there's a theme that interests you, and you can certainly watch and decide what you want to watch on that basis. So I'll share that document as well as all of this with you. It seems to me to be germane to and pertinent to the discussion. And if any of you wanted to watch that on a laptop or something, you could do that literally by clicking on the link. So today, uh, what I intend to do is give you a sense of the reality of the time. And I want to take us back a little bit into the negotiation process itself in order to understand, and I thank you for the analogy, in order to understand the birth, the birthing process um, that indeed, 
And I think the analogy is a very apposite one because, and I don't need to tell you the nature of giving birth, and certainly in many respects a transitional process and giving birth to a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, as you can imagine, was no smooth, was no smooth thing. And so I want to put it, I want to place that product, if you like, that transitional justice product in the context of the process that brought it about, the negotiation process <coughs> itself. So we're going to dwell a little bit on the nature of South Africa's negotiated transition. Um, I want to talk about the extent to which, if at all, transitional mechanisms, including the question of justice and reparations, featured in that process. And I want to talk a little bit about the dynamics of the negotiation process so that you understand where the TRC came from. So instead of talking about dialectically induced hybrid positions, I want to talk about political compromises because that in, 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 in our language is what we're talking about. The nature of the negotiation process was indeed essentially characterized ultimately by compromise. It was, a, it, was a, it, was a, it was indeed a big compromise that we brokered through that process. Yeah. So, so what was on the agenda when we were negotiating? What were the kinds of things that we negotiated about when we entered into this process of negotiation? Well, we spoke in the first instance about the nature, the political nature of the state. Should it be a unitary state or should it be a federal type state? And in fact, that word federal was known as the F word. <laughs> yeah. No one wanted to hear that word on the African National Congress's side. And I can go into all the reasons for that um, in, in summary, mainly because it seemed as though the National Party was hiding away a form of apartheid under a federal disposition. It wanted to entrench minority rights, group rights, and, and was keen to press forward a federal solution for that reason. It became known as the F word. It stopped us talking for a while. We avoided the F word. We avoided all expletives, certainly in the public domain, as best we could. Um, and, and so federalism, unitarism was one of those. Power sharing was another. Um, a government of national unity, the formation of a government of national unity was another um, a, agenda item. What kind of constitution should we have was an agenda item. And that led to an interim constitution being produced what kind of Bill of Human Rights should we have? That was a discussion point. The nature of the economy in the context of nationalism versus capitalism, if you put it crudely, was a, was a point of, of discussion and a point of contention. The nature and role of a future judiciary was, a, was an agenda item. All sorts of ombudsmen, independent electoral commissions, transitional executive governance arrangements, um, and so forth. The question, of course, of elections, free and fair democratic elections, that was high on our agenda at the time. And the fact that there was a high level of violence, I'll talk about this in more detail in a moment, was an agenda item. What, though, was missing, is missing, from that list. What do you think might be missing from that list? Pardon? Freedom of, speech. Freedom of speech would have been part of the Bill of Human Rights discussion. How would you feel, this is a hint, if you were a, and I don't say victim, a survivor, how would you feel if you were a survivor? You got it, thank you, and that was a, a, almost a, you know, it came right out there. It literally did. There was no discussion of reparations, yeah. That's not entirely and exactly right, and I'm going to describe to you how um, this little bit about reparations, whilst it wasn't on a formal agenda, actually got slipped in right at the end. Um, and, and, and I see I've preempted myself by saying I'll share with you that list of films. I've got a note here to tell you that there is that list of films. Um, but let me then tell you that, that that series, that series was broadcast on the South African 
Broadcasting Corporation's channel. It was publicly broadcast also globally. But that channel um, um, led to 87 uh, 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 snippets, if you like, um, and covered the first two years of our commission. That's all accessible, still online. It was produced and presented by an Afrikaner, Max Dupria, who covered the TRC in this fashion. Max, an amazing man, um, was also the editor-in-chief of um, South Africa's Afrikaans newspaper, Die Freie Wirkblatt, the free weekly paper is what it was called. And from an Afrikaner perspective, even that name is amazing. So this was a guy who got it, who understood it, an Afrikaner who wanted to play a role in making sure that the country heard the story of the TRC. His series won the Foreign Correspondence Award for Outstanding Journalism in 1996. So if you do watch some of this footage, it is certainly well done and well worth watching. Right, so, so the transition to a, 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 a democracy from this oligarchy, from this dictatorial white racist minority regime, this was characterized, if you like, by compromise and concession. Um, and, and certainly it is true to say that the pursuit of justice in the context of a human rights agenda, that was always a central theme of the liberation movements, of the movements that were struggling for freedom in South Africa during apartheid. So this idea that there should be accountability, that there should be justice, that there should be some form of reckoning was always a central tenet of the struggle for freedom in South Africa. It was never something that was invented post facto after 94. It was always something the African National Congress and other liberation movements felt strongly about. But these concerns remained largely off our negotiation table. To what extent, in a febrile environment, these issues are highly sensitive and indeed highly contestable. You can just imagine to what extent this was uh, contestable terrain if you have 25 political parties around the table negotiating a peaceful settlement to a conflict. What should be looked into? Exactly what should be looked into? How should it be looked into? To what end? These all depended as much on the personal insights and personal experiences of negotiators in that process as on anything else. And ladies and gentlemen, one man's freedom fighter, one person's freedom fighter, was another person's terrorist. Defenders of law and order, for some, were instruments of inhumanity and repression for others. So you had this, this situation of um, debate. And in fact, I'm, 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 I'm even thinking about tonight's discussion as I say that all sides, all sides, the African National Congress, the Inkata Freedom Party, the Pan-African Congress, the National Party, the Conservative Alliance, all of these parties accused each other of culpability in the atrocities that had happened in the past and indeed for current violence happening in the streets whilst we were negotiating. No one was to blame except the other. Yeah? That is literally how it went. I am perfect. I am complete completely in the clear, and you are the ones who are fermenting. You caused all the problems, and you're fermenting the violence right now. That is exactly how it played out. It was a kindergarten. And you might think of analogies. That's why I think of the one tonight, because 
when you think of some of that bellicose and aggressive rhetoric, when you think of the name calling, when you think of how unhelpful that is, and when I had that experience here, then I wonder why we didn't learn from that in 94 and think we're in 2016 and know that name calling doesn't help. It doesn't help. We all, we all accused each other of culpability. And at the same time, we denied, we excused, we obfuscated, we ran away from our own roles in history and in the present. This was a characteristic of this process. That's why it broke down twice before we got it going a third time. Of course, it is true to say that interpretations of responsibility for past violations were challenging. How to deal with them, understandings of how to deal with those were, were, were challenging at the time. Notions of morality, notions of value, notions of principle seem to be so relative and of course relative to one's own position in particular. The conflicts of the past were littered with I say victims, but survivors, of course, because they survived. Those who were lucky enough to survive. Who would accommodate their interests? How would their interests be accommodated in any process? Indeed, ladies and gentlemen, was it possible to move forward, to even put in place something, a constitutional dispensation, let's say, with a justiciable bill of human rights? Was it possible to do this without some form of reckoning that first took place. And of course, conversely, there were arguments that said that if we put in place some sort of mechanism that digs up the past, that holds perpetrators to account, we will slide back into that civil war we were trying to get out of. If we put in place a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, it will only exacerbate and fuel the febrile climate and cause, in fact, a worse war than the one we were trying to get out of. So you had these discussions and debates not at the negotiation table, but happening in the political parties and happening in the country whilst we were talking. <clears throat> now, despite the protestations of a small human rights community and, and ladies and gentlemen it isn't helpful to actually tar South Africa only as an awful place prior to 94 because there were folk who were rational, there were folk who were reasonable, there were folk who believed in human rights, there was a small group of them, they were in the minority which made it all the harder for them of course but even then during the negotiation process the small group of folk who were committed and who always have been committed to human rights, um, protested that this discussion around reparations and reconciliation had essentially been ring-fenced off the agenda by all the participants, all the political participants in the process. I know that sounds a bit strange. Any meaningful examination of what had happened and who was responsible had been ring-fenced off the negotiation agenda. And whilst you had this ring-fencing and suggestion that we wouldn't discuss this stuff in the negotiation process, outside in the streets, and I promise you next week I will show you some footage also of this because the violence came right into the World Trade Center where we were, as I, as I, as I said. Um, the situation was compounded daily by some of the worst levels of violence that South Africa had ever experienced. In fact, some reports suggest that over 14,000 people were killed in that four-year period whilst we negotiated at the table. What a schizophrenic, this is, a, this is the contradiction that South Africa is and remains. Whilst we were talking, whilst we were brokering a peace settlement, we had some of the worst levels of violence ever. 14,000 people dead, more, of course, injured. And so we see some commentators saying that there was more violence in that period 
than they had been in the previous 30, 30 years under, under you know, apartheid, when there was resistance to, in fact, apartheid. So, so you, I, I often describe it as a, as a kind of dual face. On the one hand, you had this peace process. We were all in these rooms talking peace. And on the other hand, you had a, a bloodbath happening, a concurrent bloodbath happening in the streets. But here's the question. Here's the question. And for those of you who were in the Mandela lectures, you will remember I, I questioned the nature of the secrecy that surrounded some of the secret negotiations that Mandela and others were involved in that seemed a precursor to the formal open public negotiation process and is it right to do things in secret and so forth. But do you think, could it be possible that a peace process might have moved forward had this agenda item not been ring-fenced? Had it not been ring-fenced off the agenda, could it have been possible for us, the 25-odd parties that were there, to talk about a peaceful process moving forward? Had we focused on reparation, had we focused on reconciliation, would we have managed to achieve a peaceful negotiation process? Yeah. So I'm putting that forward as well as all of this other uh, perspective just to give you kind of thinking points about that strange hybridity that I spoke about, the strange creature that emerges during transition, this weirdness, this uncomfortableness, this discomfort that you feel when you begin to contemplate some of the reality that we went through in this transition pr process and begin then also potentially to link it to some of that theory where I suggested that this hybridity is a strange creature. And I'm hoping that you might begin to see here some of the emergent strangeness that I'm going to be describing over these weeks that we're, that we're fortunately together. Now, it is true to say that um, negotiations and the negotiated process in South Africa conformed at the time with the legal processes, with the legal framework that was in place at that time. So we're talking about the legal framework that was in place under the apartheid government, because the apartheid government remained in power until two, uh, 1994. So our negotiated settlement happened within the framework of the existing apartheid uh, legal framework. And in order to begin to sketch the inheritance of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, because this inheritance shaped the way it functioned, I want to focus now on a thing known as indemnity. Indemnity for crimes. The government of the day, the National Party government of the day, in 1990 introduced a first a first act, an indemnity act, and this indemnity act was designed purposefully to allow African National Congress, South African Communist Party, and other folk to come into South Africa to sit around a table. Because they were, they were wanted folk, they were wanted people. They, had they come to South Africa, the police would have grabbed them, probably the intelligence services, and they'd have been tortured. Legislation, amnesty legislation was passed to give these folk, in fact, temporary amnesty initially, so that they could come and sit around a table with the National Party. Now, I know that that was much more a pragmatic thing for the Africana than a, than a heartfelt thing, because the Africana at the time felt that they were inviting the Antichrist to the table. And lest you think I'm pretending, lest you think that's hyperbole, believe me, that's how they saw Mandela and others. Joe Slovo, the leader of the South African Communist Party, was hated. He was seen as the de facto Antichrist. He was an atheist. Need I say more? I actually don't know what his religious views were, but that's how he was seen. A communist must be an atheist. 
<coughs> so, so for them to pass this indemnity legislation and get that far, wow, big deal. Um, in 1992, the government of the day, the National Party, the Afrikaner Party, passed further indemnity legislation. <laughs> this time, the indemnity legislation was in stark contrast to that of its predecessor, which enabled negotiations to begin to start. What did it do? And I'll dwell on this in a little more detail in a moment. Its intention with that legislation, and it achieved this, was to give immunity to those whom it felt were responsible for human rights violations. So it unilaterally introduced indemnity legislation, which indemnified a lot of people, I'll give you the figures in a moment, indemnified them against what they'd done in the past, 1992. Yeah, so we're, we're building up the backdrop to the, to the TRC here. I'm, I'm sketching the things that the TRC inherited because certainly you might be saying, but Clive, that's, that's the remit of the TRC, surely. Surely you're taking away the remit of the TRC here. You're preempting what it might do. That's what happened. Now, let me just say that in, in, in the wake of, an, of, 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 a, of, a, of a, a number of centuries that, have, that were characterized by violence and oppression um, in South Africa, um, the dilemma, the, the justice-related dilemma is, the, is, is this one that, that you begin to think about the possibility of comprehensive prosecutions, which often, more often than not, is an impossibility, um, even logistically, never mind the cost. And, and we'll talk about costs and logistics and why the TRC was limited to two years and things like that in a, in a while, because justice fell at the, at, the, at, the, at the feet of cost as much as it did anything else. And, and certainly, you will recognize, though, that despite the challenge of comprehensive prosecutions, you can sense that sweeping amnesties are unjust. You can sense that a sweeping, a blanket amnesty feels unjust. At least I feel that. I, I don't know, I can't speak for you, but I certainly feel that a kind of amnesty granted in secret doesn't feel right. Claims to justice, claims to truth, claims to reconciliation, all of these claims that are made about our Truth and Reconciliation Commission, they don't rest on abstract or theoretical claims. They rest on the realities I'm describing. They rest, ladies and gentlemen, on what actually happened. And that's why it's important for me also to portray what happened before it came into being in the context of things that relate directly to its remit. And certainly a large part of its inheritance relates to the way in which amnesty was handled during that negotiated transition to democracy. And so any claims to success, any claims to efficacy, any claims to impact that we make as we talk about the TRC moving forward have to also include the TRC's relations with other provisions that impact on it concerning the granting of indemnities, immunities, releases from prison and pardons. It has to take into account legal cases as granted from time to time during this transitional negotiation process. And certainly the social contract that was brokered, which is a thing political parties broker as part of a negotiation process, which in the South African case combined, if you like, the promise of amnesty on the one hand with the seeming threat of prosecution on the other, all of this needs to be taken into account when we begin to think about why the TRC what it did what it did and how good was it at doing what it ultimately did. And when we get to the contemporary perspective at the end and we look at some of the criticisms, we need to understand some of those criticisms in, the, in this context. So it, it is fair to say, I think, um, 
I think it is fair to say, in fact, I would say that it is fair to say that the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission entered an arena that was already occupied certainly by a series of amnesty provisions. It didn't come in de novo, it didn't come in tabula rasa, it didn't come in with a blank piece of paper, it inherited certain amnesties that had happened. And let me tell you, because I, want to, I, I just want to, for your benefit, I hope, dwell in a little bit more detail on, on, the, on what those amnesties actually were. I just want to describe them a little bit. Um, so that we understand what they were and what their implications were. Let me say that in relation to all of these, except the amnesties which were granted by the TRC itself, all of these were surrounded by a lack of transparency, a lack of accountability, and certainly, and I want to talk about a second amnesty. You, you didn't think I'd be finished with amnesty, did you? You didn't think the National Party would stop, did you? And it, it wasn't only the National Party. In fact, the picture becomes more complicated as we move forward. Um, all of these amnesty relations, uh, 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 acts, sorry, were surrounded by a lack of transparency and accountability. So what were the acts? Let's have a quick look at the acts. What were the acts that governed amnesty? So the first one was the Indemnity Act number 35 of 1990. This one was designed and it had an altruistic motive. It's a great act. I liked it at the time. It's fantastic. Although I wish it never needed to exist and that folk could have freely been in South Africa. But that's another matter. It was designed to facilitate the negotiation process. It granted temporary immunity or indeed permanent indemnity in some instances for political exiles against prosecution when they returned then to South Africa from wherever they were in, in Europe or in Africa in exile. Yeah? And, and it also, in fact, made release then for, it made provision for the release of political prisoners who were languishing in jails at the time um, and enabled them, of course, then to become negotiators. The second act was known as the Further Indemnity Act. The Further Indemnity Act number 151 of 1992, and this was passed unilaterally by the National Party, and it granted indemnity to state offenders and made provision for secrecy regarding the actions for which indemnity was granted. <clears throat> so we don't know. We don't know what they did. That's the law. The law says we won't know what they did. There is an academic, greedy, he's, he's, he, he writes so well, and um, if any of you want to read a book about our transition, I would recommend Paul Greedy. He wrote in 2010, and I quote from his book on um, the South African Truth Commission on page 96. He describes this act, ladies and gentlemen, as an amnesty of the blanket and quick fire forgetting variety. That's how he describes that. He tells us that it ensured that up to 3,500 members of the security forces and the cabinet, he says that, were secretly indemnified in the run-up to the elections in 1994. I don't like it one bit. And I'm happy to say that on that camera. <clears throat> The legality of this has been politically disputed. It's, it's, it's not as though we just accepted that. There were folk who didn't like it, of course. Yeah, I'm sure you don't like it. But the indemnities that were granted unilaterally by the National Party at this time have been respected by the newly emerged at that time democratically elected government. They've respected 
that. Now, if I'm struggling with that, how hard must that be to do? How hard must it be to do that, to say, I will never know? When we know that one of the key features, characteristics of the TRC, was that folk in many instances said, you know, I don't need revenge. I don't need money. I don't need reparations. I just want to know what happened to my loved ones. Just please tell me. They begged for the bones. They begged, if they couldn't find the bones, to find the river or to find the dumping ground or whatever. We know that that was a central feature of many participants' desire. Yet, yeah, we have this secrecy. And we have an honorable post dictatorship government led by Mandela who says, fine, I respect that. We respect that. We respect that legal process that happened. So apartheid era deals were being negotiated not only during the negotiation process, but even during the TRC process. And when I get to that messy business, then um, yeah, you'll begin to see how complicated all of this actually was. And so Greedy places the impact of these acts the cumulative impact of these, these acts and secret agreements in perspective. And he suggests that, are you ready for these figures? I don't know if I ever like to, to read them. Between 13,000 and 21,000, now we don't know of course, between 13,000 and 21,000 people received amnesty. How many received amnesty during the TRC process? 1,167. And that was those that received secret amnesty through the conditional amnesty process, by the way. There was a conditional amnesty process attached to the functioning. We'll still get to how it worked. But I'm just giving you a sense at this, mo at this point of proportionality. Yeah. That's a lot of people doing a lot of bad things that we don't know anything about. Right, so I do, I remind myself here that we will explore this messiness later. At this point, I just want to give you the picture in relation to amnesty, because I'm trying to give you a sense of the climate of the time, the background, and as I say, um, um, a sense of this negotiation, this political compromise the nature of this political compromise, of which secret amnesty, you can say, was a part, was embedded in this question of compromise. It was part of the inheritance of the TRC, and it created the environment within which the TRC needed to set up its operations. Violence levels during this negotiated transition were high. They were as high as the stakes. Um, the government during this time constantly claimed that it was committed to routing out this behavior that it knew nothing about, this politically violent, politically motivated violence that it knew nothing about. But certainly its inaction spoke volumes at the time, as inaction often does, as silence often does. During this time, its security forces were routinely and often accused of either direct or indirect complicity in this, in, this, in this spike of four years' worth of violence. And certainly the vast majority of South Africans during this process looked upon the minority government at that time with a mixture of fear, contempt, and loathing because of all these emergent views on their complicity in fomenting this violence in, in our streets. The government, in order to distance itself and um, expunge itself and prove that it wasn't part of this, set up two judicial commissions of inquiry. Not one, but two. Um, certainly during the early um, stages of the negotiation process, right at the beginning, you had, we had a thing known as the Harms Commission, and it was, it was established to probe allegations of police and military hit squad complicity and activity. Now, its findings 
insofar as it was able to put them into the public domain, and it was, are a damning indictment of the criminal justice system up to that, up to that point. And, and, and from my perspective, it remains a classic example of a well-staged and well-managed cover-up. It had a, a successor, and you may recognize the name. Uh, it was known as the Goldstone Commission. So some of you may know Richard or be aware of uh, Judge Richard Goldstone and his work also internationally. It was set up in 1991, a year after this. And it began to prize some of the lid off this cover-up and began to surface some of the security force involvement in what was known as dirty tricks, certainly towards the end of its tenure as a commission. But none of, neither of these commissions did, did much by way of either surfacing the truth, as would later emerge in the TRC, and, and certainly didn't help to stop the violence um, and the bloodletting in the streets. Now, during the negotiation process, so 1990 to 1994, the African National Congress had already begun to signal its commitment to probing accountability for its own past violations and had begun, in fact, to hold its own commissions of inquiry, if you want to call them that, especially into some of the abusive um, things that occurred in some of its holding camps. There was one known as Quattro in Angola, which was particularly problematic from a human rights perspective, where the African National Congress had, as it then said at the TRC, and you can watch it online if you like, said that there were human rights abuses that it had perpetrated during the struggle. To, despite the limitations, because of course that was it looking at itself, and there's always a problem with that. You know, if I look at myself in the mirror, well, no, let me not go there. Um, I was going to say I always make myself look better than I think I am, but it's, it's the opposite. It, it's, it's the absolute opposite. I need to go on a diet. Um, <laughs> Um, this kind of introspection was, uh, was unprecedented, in, in fact, for a liberation movement generally. Liberation movements across the globe do not necessarily introspect in the way that the African National Congress did. And certainly this kind of um, introspection um, was, was unprecedented also in South Africa. And it encouraged those within the anti-apartheid movement and indeed in broader civil society it encouraged those to continue then to say we ought to pursue this agenda even if it isn't on the agenda of the negotiation um, uh, table itself. Um, and of course you can see to what extent if the African National Congress was saying yes we want to look at ourselves that might be a heartening thing in a climate where um, one perhaps didn't want to do this. The, the Zulus, the Inkata Freedom Party at that time was comprehensively and fully and classically, as is its tradition, um, inflexible and, and never accepted blame. It blamed the African National Congress primarily for all the violence that was occurring in our streets and always painted itself as an innocent victim of premeditated uh, attempts to annihilate it. And the, so the, the Inkata Freedom Party, in contradistinction to the ANC, has never attempted this introspection and has been a, a, a problematic participant in the truth and reconciliation process in any event, as we shall see, um, and always believes and has believed that it saw itself as a, as a systematically vilified victim of intimidation and violence, propaganda and misrepresentation. By about 1993, uh, how am I doing for time? Am I still good for time? Because I, I so we'll go a little longer and then, uh, okay, we'll go another 10 minutes or so and then we'll do some, some questions. D do you have burning questions? <laughs> yeah, uh, you have some questions, okay. Because if you don't, you know, we can use the time. <laughs> Either way, we'll fill the time. Um, um, but I, I, do want to, I do want to get to that, that point. Um, 
By 1993, the African National Congress's leadership, the other leadership, had begun to accept this idea that there might not be any trials of the Nuremberg type. There might not be any criminal trials. There might not be a criminal series of trials for apartheid crimes. And certainly at that point, about a year before our elections, the National Party and, and definitely its security chiefs, the, the, the generals and the heads of intelligence and so forth, had, had begun to signal that they supported the idea of a general amnesty and that some guarantee was needed around amnesty in any event. So, so the ANC was beginning to say, we can see that there might not be all these trials for atrocities, and the National Party was still pressing hard on more indemnity than they had already passed in 1992. Yeah. <clears throat> And, 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 and in all of this, and, and, and I say here, by the way, we should ask ourselves why. Why, why were they doing that? You know, so so the, the, those thousands were, were only the tip of the iceberg. The African National Congress was prepared at this point to begin to compromise on the principles around amnesty. It was prepared to begin to think about a compromise, but it wasn't prepared to tie itself at this point in, in 93, a year before the elections, to a specific amnesty deal. It didn't want to tie itself down to a particular um, prescription around amnesty. It argued at that time that the detail of an amnesty process should be the responsibility of a democratically elected government. <clears throat> and in fact, that's what it had argued about a final constitution as well. The National Party never wanted in the first instance elections and then a constitution and elections and then a TRC. They always wanted a long drawn out process of negotiations leading to a form of power sharing. Forget the elections. So what resulted in this process of the ANC beginning to think about adjusting its view on trials and, 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 and criminal proceedings on the one hand and the National Party pressing hard still for amnesty was the inclusion of the provision for amnesty in the post-amble of the interim constitution which was produced in 1994 together with an election. Um, so, it was, so the interim constitution was a product of our negotiation process. And into that, right at the end, at the back, a provision for amnesty was slipped in. Right at, at in fact, at the, uh, at the sort of tail end, if you like, December 1993, at the tail end of the process, we had elections in April 94. This provision, for amnesty, which is now an agreement also between then the ANC and the NP. So it's no longer, you know, we're no, no longer now just pointing the finger at the, at the National Party, which I like to do. Um, I hope you will forgive me for that. I do like to do that. <laughs> they conscripted me. I'll never forgive them for that. <laughs> and, and that's only the beginning. Um, they slipped this amnesty in at the end, in, in December 93, presented it as a fait accompli to the nation. There was no public opposition at that point. It was slipped in the process. We were on the threshold of our first um, elections. Let me tell you, it was a euphoric time. It was an amazing time to be alive. It was a fabulous time to be alive. Four months before that April, I mean, you know, I went into the Independent Electoral Commission as the director, the national director of voter education. I had the privilege to travel around that country orchestrating voter education efforts. It was fantastic. People everywhere were ready. You could see that when the queues came out. If you cast your minds back, those queues, those long queues, people were just so excited for the first time to be able to do that. It was fantastic. 
No detail at this point when the amnesty provision was slipped in. There was no detail about what this provision meant. There was no commitment made in that provision to examine the conflicts of the past. And in fact, the African National Congress's position that this would be deferred to a new government then prevailed. <clears throat> so if you think about it, you can see that the outcome of negotiations was that the option for pursuing justice, the option for pursuing justice in the context of an accountability agenda was not completely closed down by the negotiation process, despite the fact that it wasn't on the agenda. Ultimately, the way it was put into the interim constitution meant that it was certainly probably in line with the ANC's strategic thinking that this kind of provision would be a good thing to have in the context of where it might intend to take the country once it governed. Given the broad nature of these provisions, and they are broad, given the broad nature of these provisions in the interim constitution, they allow for a wide interpretation. They certainly allow for a wider interpretation by the then new democratic government than might otherwise have been the case. So however we look at this, and whether we think about it critically in the context of slipping it in and so forth, there seem also then in the, in the, in the, in the broader picture of the strange creature, this hybrid thing, you can begin to see also how many of these strange things somehow at the time might make some sort of sense for a peace process moving forward, maybe. Within weeks, within weeks of the historic 94 elections, the African National Congress dominated government, and it was then a government of national unity. Um, and that's another series is describing this negotiation process and how it worked and, and so forth. Um, the, the, the ANC dominated government of national unity immediately initiated a process that began to lead to an act known as the Promotion of National Unity and Reconciliation Act. And consequently, that act then put in place the groundwork for the establishment of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And that was within weeks. So one does have the feeling, I think, ladies and gentlemen, that the groundwork for this had already been prepared. Such alacrity, such readiness to put forward this, 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 this act, this legal instrument. Um, and, and one does wonder to what extent informal discussions, certainly within the African National Congress, had already put in place the groundwork for that quick slip into the interim constitution and then an act immediately after the elections. In any event, key members of the African National Congress had always been and were keen to develop and put in place a mechanism, some sort of mechanism, to, to examine past violations. In order to achieve that, and in sharp contradistinction to the way in which things had been done in the past, the African National Congress engaged several civil society actors, several uh, NGOs and other pe prominent people in civil society to form part of a broader debate then about what was possible, what could be done, how might one do this, and how might one shape legislation that could underpin a process of truth and reconciliation. And of course, South Africa, in contradistinction to many countries that have gone through transition, was the only country at that time to have engaged also now post-election post in, such, in such public debates about these, these, these transitional questions of truth and reconciliation, the terms of, of, of such a mechanism, the scope of such a mechanism, what it should do and so forth. So this, this was unprecedented. And, and it, is, it, is, it is right and proper to say that a group of, of civil society activists, organizations, 
primarily from the human rights field, from the human rights NGO sector in South Africa, and certainly also the churches. A lot of our churches played a key role and an influential role in the subsequent post-94 drafting of the formulation of legislation. There were indeed a, a series of workshops that were held by these folk in support of the African National Congress and the government of the day to develop and think about legislation and processes and so forth. Um, there were also public hearings that were held by the Justice Parliamentary Portfolio Commission, public hearings um, um, and, and, and the solicitation of submissions from um, the public in, 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 in helping to draft the legislation. So you can see post-94 already a, a really different way, you know, a really different way of, of, of doing things emerging almost instantly. <coughs> now, there are two views around the way in which these recommendations were taken into consideration. Some say they weren't listened to, but the broad, the broad uh, agreement is that the, the, um, the, the views of the public, the views of NGOs, etc., that all of this was taken into account, that this was extensive. And certainly, the provisions in relation to transparency and the question of implementing a, what was described, and in their words, a victim-centered process, that these were achievements largely due also to the, the public and, and NGO and civil society input into the nature of the legislation. Civil society groups, for example, su successfully opposed a recommendation from both the African National Congress and the National Party that amnesty hearings should all be held in camera. That was an original design concept. All amnesty hearings should be held in camera. Civil society opposed that and was successful in opposing that. The ANC government, dominated government, listened to them and said, fine, we won't hold those amnesty hearings in camera. What is in camera? Uh, in, in secret. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so it wouldn't be, so, so the idea is, so if you have a, a, a judicial proceeding in camera, it means um, you don't have the public there. You literally just have sort of, you know, yeah. So, so that was, and, and remember what I said, the ANC and the NP had proposed that, and civil society had opposed it, and 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 it had it had won the day. That these would be so. So the ANC and the NP wanted a hidden amnesty process, and of course the NP had a tradition of that. So we shouldn't be surprised by that. Um, what is a little surprising is the ANC position. It's twelve o'clock. Thank you so much, ma'am. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's 12 o'clock. Does anyone have a question? Or, or, so, so I saw a hand here and a hand there. We'll go first here. You said that during the negotiations, there were 14,000 people killed. Uh, was there any, can you give some sort of a very rough breakdown of the ethnicity of those who were killed? Mm. So the question, if you didn't hear it, was what is the ethnic breakdown of people who were killed during the negotiation process? I'm almost inclined to ask you to answer the question, um, because the answer to that, and by ethnicity, it's a hard question to answer, because there are many ethnic groups in South Africa. So I'm not going to answer it in ethnic breakdown terms, they were by and large black. And, and in fact, maybe I can say that because of the amount of violence on the, on the, um, in the mines, um, a lot of that was Zulu and Koza. Um, so, so it wasn't whites against blacks necessarily. And this is the interesting thing about the way in which the Zulus sided with the National Party in those clandestine activities in relation to the murder of Kozas and others. And so the Inkata Freedom Party and the National Party in relation to death squads and hit squads, perhaps not so much, but certainly squads of, of thugs who would go into, say, mining compounds with um, what we call shamboks, long whip-like things, and of course 
worse things, pangas, and go in there and chop people up and chase them and so forth, that this would, you know, uh, uh, fan the flames that were needed to derail the negotiation process, that this was happening. So ethnic in that sense, ethnic in that sense, but certainly by and large, you didn't see en masse white people dying. It was, it was, you know, a, a, it was a lot of, and of course there were white death squads and hit squads that were also, it was a, it was a, it was an awful and messy and ugly thing. And a lot of that came out. We didn't know that there were the existence of farms where death squads operated from clandestinely and completely without the knowledge of anyone with funding and so forth to do all these all these things and more, to murder activists, to send bombs in, in post and all sorts of things. Um, there was a, a hand there. Yeah. Could you give us your um, reaction and evaluation to President Jacob Zuma and his situation right now, what you think is going to happen? The, we, the, the South Africa has a, uh, and this may sound strange because of apartheid, but South Africa does have a proud and strong legal tradition, despite the fact that the justice system, of course, was apartheid riddled, and there's no doubt that it was that it was in favour of the white minority. At the same time, still has a robust, liberal, um, strong um, history of 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 principled argument, and that includes, in fact, some of the Afrikaner judges and so forth who often, or at least sometimes, came to positions that you might think they would have pressure, political pressure on them not to come to. So this idea that we've had a strong and, and indeed proud legal tradition is a good one. And I say that by way of preamble because if there ever was a moment when a South African like me could have hope, it is the hope that we have in the constitutional court ruling, a majority ruling, in favor of telling the president that he's wrong, telling the president that he is not right in enhancing his home to the extent of however many millions that he did. And, uh, 30 million. And of arguing that his swimming pool is a, 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 a repository for water in case of a fire. Um, <laughs> you know, um, he needed a pool for security reasons. I like to swim in my pool. <laughs> I don't have one, but yeah, I use my pool for swimming. So, so my perspective is that finally, finally someone has had the courage, and it is our judiciary, our highest court in the land, that has had the courage to stand up to Zuma and tell Zuma, you are wrong. And now, of course, with Ahmed Katrada, who was in the Ravonia trial with Nelson Mandela, one of our elders, saying, he needs to step down, and he's, I think he's 87 now, or in his, well in his 80s, very principled man saying that, I think his time has come. So from my perspective, and you asked me my perspective, the sooner he goes, the better. <clears throat> and I think the momentum might be there. Now, the ANC, he won an impeach, he, he wasn't impeached in parliament. The ANC majority was big enough for him not to be impeached. So he survived that, but I'm hoping that the pressure, he's an embarrassment. He's an, you know, there are some politicians <laughs> that are an international embarrassment. <laughs> I couldn't, I, I just could not resist that. <laughs> you know, I do that on purpose because sometimes people stereotype Africa and they stereotype Africans and they say, you know, you guys, you know, it's all corrupt and it's all bad and what's that with, Af you know, Africa and and South Africa might be all this, you know, and, and, and of course, of course one needs to see these things seriously in perspective. And so I made that point tongue in cheek, but I make that point in all seriosity too, you know, that there are international embarrassments, they abound in our political classes. Um, and I am embarrassed by, by Zuma, um, I, will, I will say that, yeah. Have we run out of time? Questions? I no, you've not run out of time. Good. Question over here and then the gentleman over there. <coughs> Was this sort of thinking unique to, of, of a truth and reconciliation concept, 
unique to Mandela and this society? No. So the idea of truth and reconciliation commissions isn't new to, uh, wasn't new to us. And indeed, from Latin America, we had many activists come over, and we took um, 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 design points. We took lessons. We took um, thoughts from them in relation to what our TRC might look like. So, um, no, we're not alone in, in, in having had a, a TRC. There were precedents before us. What, what was unique, of course, is our particularly um, carefully constructed and certainly open process. So, so no, we had learned from, from others. We, we, well, uh, uh, yeah, we had learned. I think we had learned from others. Uh, yes, just sir. a comment uh, in relation to this lady's earlier question. Uh, in camera legislation, it has been historically a, a bit of a problem with our Tennessee legislature. Uh, it, and uh, we, we're quite familiar with that, unfortunately. <laughs> I don't think I need to say a word. <laughs> you recommended a book uh, writ about the TRC written by Paul somebody. I wanted to get that last name. G-R-E-A-D-Y, Greedy. And I, I can't remember the exact name of the book. It's a long name. I can bring it with next time. And I can also circulate it to Norma. Um, it was published in 2010. And it gives a great overview of transitional justice and then homes in specifically on the South African TRC. Some, so, so published in 2010, there's a, amazing hindsight in that book. Um, wonderfully well written and gently but you know, carefully constructed critique um, with a view to, again, enabling yet more folk, when will it ever end, to develop better TRCs than we had so that's why it's a and all the other critique that's why it's so so good to have these these books i think i think i wish we could get to a point where we didn't have trcs anymore and didn't need them that's an idealistic statement of course i've been cu accused of being an idealist on this campus i'm an unashamed idealist <laughs> and i unashamedly speak to students in that fashion because we need that perspective more than ever Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you will, if you brought in coffee cups or things. Make